Uh, so hi, yeah, I'm Crispin Cooper from Sustainable Places. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm talking about uh, recent work I've been doing planning and walking and cycling networks for schools and leisure centres. Um, so this is actually a, a collaboration um, funded by Monmouthshire Council, um, who engaged Sustrans to do their uh, cycle and walking network to, uh, for schools planning. Um, and Sustrans came to me in turn to do some of the modelling work for them. And uh, the, the last body I wanted to bring into this was Leeds, where Robin Lovelace has also been doing some great work on modelling cycling. Um, and I saw this as an opportunity to um, bring a few of us together and um, you know, combine knowledge and techniques and, and make something greater than the sum of its parts. So it's a, it's a small pilot project, but it's been exciting and a great opportunity to work on it. Um, so briefly going over our uh, previous research, um, I've been making, uh, excuse me, there you go, slide. I've been making cycling models um, since 2016. Um, and you know this, this is one of them, you're seeing sort of a three-dimensional landscape because obviously gradients affect cyclist decisions and you know, steepness of hills and so on. Um, they've been used uh, by a bunch of people externally now, um, including in particular in the UK, Arab have used them to model um, the networks for over 20 local authorities in the UK. Um, um, and various people abroad have, have used them. Um, and also, um, uh, they've been used in medical big data models like UK Biobank. Um, I've also done, um, last year we did the first ever uh, longitudinal test of a strategic pedestrian model. So it was sort of uh, looking at the past, seeing, um, for those of you who know Cardiff, um, the centre of Cardiff was ripped out in about between 2006 and 2010 to build the new St David's 2 and John Lewis. And we we modelled uh, the changes in be pedestrian behaviour with our models that we'd expect to see if we just had the data from before those changes to see if we correctly predict what happened afterwards. Um, and we combine all these different types of pedestrian um, flow pattern created by different behaviours with machine learning, make some predictions, and it did match the data was the good news. So um, we sort of had some validation there in the academic literature. Um, I've also done some work uh, with one of my students on um, modelling uh, severance experienced by people with limited mobilities so looking at parts of the network for example in this case that you can't get to easily if you can't climb a flight of steps um, you can get to it but it's it's much longer way around than it would be for most people um, Robin um, on the other hand up in Leeds he made this thing called PCT the propensity to cycle tool um, it was funded by the Department for Transport and has become a recommended tool of theirs that looks at um, flows between different zones um, and I'll come a bit more later to that, well, what we've used from that, um, explaining in a bit more depth. Um, he's also built several things on top of this, um, like this is an extension called the Cycling um, cycling Infrastructure Prioritization Toolkit. Um, more recently, and I think it's quite exciting, he's had this project called Act On, for, this is called Active Travel for New Developments. Um, and it includes this wonderful visualization where you can see um, sort of all the active travel trips flowing around a network. Um, Robin's strength, I think, is, you know, hugely, firstly, in the transport practice side, he knows a, a lot more than me. And secondly, in the visualization side, um, uh, getting, bringing projects like this together, which is really great for engaging people. Um, I think, conversely, my strength is the modeling. Um, you know, I, I think he would admit that the modeling underneath this particular visualization is at the moment quite simple, for example. So what we've been really looking to do is combine our respective strengths in a project. Um, and that brings us to the current project then. So. Um, as I say, um, funded by Monmouthshire. Um, why this focus um, rather than all destinations? You know, previously in our work, we've looked at traveling to all destinations rather than um, just specific destinations like a school. And from a planning perspective, encouraging active travel is not just about the network infrastructure, but it's about a complete package of interventions, uh, policies, promotion, education, incentives, facilities at destinations, and even wider cultural issues. Um, uh, Sarah in this meeting would tell you a lot about gender issues, for example, that impact people's um, freedom to choose different transport modes. Um, and so one can argue that the specific destination approach allows for more focused management of all these surrounding issues with a specific um, group of users. Um, so, you know, moving on from just looking at the network itself um, and also local authorities. This is the other reason we're doing this, of course, is that local authorities are interested in doing it this way. Um, here's a quick summary of the approach we took and the different outputs we made. Um, so there's various factors that guided the decisions behind uh, making this uh, this framework. 
Firstly, cycling numbers, you have to note, are very low at the moment. Um, currently in Monmouthshire, I think about 4% of primary pupils get to school by bike and under 2% of secondary pupils. Now, if, um, if you look at Holland, for example, um, that number's around 41%. So there's an absolutely massive increase, it's 20, 20 odd fold increase in cycling levels that we're looking at if we wanted to achieve something like they have in Holland. And so modeling infrastructure alone really isn't gonna cut it. We're looking at massive cultural shifts and honestly, quantitatively, we don't know how to model those. So what do you actually do from a planning perspective? Um, and this is where Robin's um, Go Dutch model, which he put in the original propensity to cycle tool comes in. Um, is that you know we can predict the likely routes people would take. What what, what he does is takes um, the Dutch um, sort of cycling behaviour model and it transports it into the UK and says, well, if the Dutch all lived here, what would they be doing, and what routes would they be taking? And although that's not what's happening here, we're essentially planning for the future as to where we can support that sort of behaviour with the right infrastructure. So instead of trying to have a, a really accurate um, quantified prediction of human behavior we're, we're kind of modeling what ifs and saying and trying to support those what ifs walking numbers on the other hand uh, there's moderate levels of walking um, going on already i think 34 percent of uh, trips to primary schools walked at the moment in monmouthshire and 41 percent secondary um, and we so we can predict routes but again we have a problem actually predicting what influences people's decisions in terms of the network for a different reason which is just the lack of data on the network itself we don't have um, you know, all the fine grade detail on how pleasant different routes are to walk that makes that um, possible. But as a step towards that, um, one novelty I brought into this project was um, modeling both sides of the road separately in walking models. So here, I'll show you this in greater detail. We can model the impact of having to cross busy roads in terms of being a deterrent factor to walking. Um, so we do this, um, as I say, in the cycling, the Go Dutch scenario. We also look at uh, my previous cycling models. My approach I take there is to compare what the world would look like with and without uh, motorized traffic deterring people from cycling. And where those changes are greatest, they hint to us that there might be a role for some sort of segregated infrastructure to um, make the cycle, uh, to give the cyclist an experience in those locations, in those key locations of traveling um, without being risking, hit, uh, without the risk of being hit by a car. So um, on the walking front, we look at flows and I also model severance. So this is the situation where, for example, you have the crow flight right route to school might be quite short, but the shortest route on the network might be quite long in this case because of a river. Um, this is not a well chosen example, I'm afraid, but actually, you know, it hints here you could build a bridge. Um, this is not what we do, but exactly this situation goes on a little further down the river here in Chepstow, and um, I believe there is a bridge under consideration, so severance is a relevant consideration, something that's worth mapping in transport models. Um, where are we? Uh, come back to that. Further considerations um, I'd like to talk about um, is how it's best to plan for specific destinations, but not lose that site that we have of other destinations in our models so how to ensure that we don't neglect integration with the wider network when we plan for one destination um, how to address the usual difficulties in active travel modeling the fact that we're dealing with small scale trips we need high resolution models um, and we have a lack of recent data often and a uh, lack of money um, and in some sense this leads to me presenting simplicity as of models as a feature not a bug um, firstly because it's low cost and secondly, because of transparency, if the um, model, if you're asking yourself is the question, is the model wrong or the planner wrong? If a planner is looking at this, then someone who's not technically trained in modeling needn't necessarily see the model as a black box if the assumptions behind it are very transparent. Um, so also in that vein, um, I couldn't think of a better way to illustrate automation than with a picture of Daft Punk, but um, uh, this process we developed is actually very highly automated. Um, now, this is of interest both to academics and to practitioners. Um, to an academic, it makes research more reproducible, which is something we've been banging on about for years, um, and transparent. So it's the model is pretty much at the point now, almost, not quite, but almost, that if you given a spreadsheet of the people's home postcodes, which we've been working with in Monmouthshire, plus um, just drawing a polygon on a map, um, then we hit a button on the computer and it just downloads all the relevant data that it needs to model that and runs the models and spits out the results. Um, so that is a process that is, you know, the other academics could also do 
using our code. So there's um, this much better um, reproducibility of research. And of course, uh, interesting to practitioners too, because it's a transparent process and it's quick to scale up once it's working. So let's look at some of the actual outputs. Um, as you saw from uh, Robin's previous work, he's made plenty of web interfaces to engage people and show them um, you know, how transport models work. Anybody can log in and use these. Um, these are still under development at the moment for the current project. Or in fact, we, we put them on the back burner because it became uh, apparent quite quickly that SUSTRANS are more interested in getting GIS outputs that they could in, integrate into their reports. So we focused on that and developing the, the GIS side instead, but there is a component of presenting models on the web to this project. Um, here's an example, a uh, cycling summary from Monmouth um, showing, so the red lines or the purple lines here are the, the uh, PCT, the Propensity to Cycles Tools Go Dutch scenario. What would it look like if Monmouth was full of Dutch people behaving in Dutch ways who cycled to the school there? Um, and but we're also showing on this network the uh, predicted the everywhere to everywhere flows from SDNA from my own work and overlaying one on the other, you can see how the flows to one particular uh, destination integrate with the flows from the wider network, but also where the wider network contains major flows, which are missed by just considering that destination. Um, I said I'd talk a bit about modeling both sides of the road in more detail. So here's something we can do looking at road crossings. If we zoom in on a couple of crossings there, um, you can see the exact predictive paths that pupils take through the network coming to a crossing here. These round crossings are formal crossings. Um, so where there's, for example, light pelican crossing, press a button, the lights change. Um, and you can see the exact routes people take through the network. Um, of course, informal crossings are maybe more major concern as a safety and deterrent issue. So we mark those with stars. And in this case, color coded by um, whether they're crossing major roads, secondary or tertiary roads. Um, and we had some great feedback from SUSTRANS actually, that this modeling both sides of the road is useful and helps stimulate consideration of the exact trajectories of pedestrians. Um, here's a case in point, Welsh Street, Chepstow, um, where, why is it done that? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so here we have a formal crossing at the top of um, Welsh Street and it encourages pupils headed um, ultimately out of this corner of the, the map to cross the road a lot earlier than they others otherwise would. And then that causes people to cross avoidably these two residential roads, um, one of which is actually quite busy, um, when they could have walked down the other side of the street all the way um, and then cross later. So it maybe raises the question, why isn't there a formal crossing down here instead of up there? Um, we can zoom in a bit, well, sorry, we can ask an, another level of why here and say, actually, why did the model even send them this way in the first place out the bottom and zoom out? And we can see here that the model is actually predicting strangely that pupils will avoid a convenient underpass of the um, A48 major trunk road in favor of crossing it at a busy crossing higher up. Why, why on earth would the model say people would do that? So our deterrence factors are taken from some recent research um, that was actually done on Hereford, conveniently close to us. Um, but it's a very simple system. We say that for a, a trunk primary or secondary road, um, an informal crossing effectively adds 340 meters to the trip length that someone perceives. So it's um, people are trying to take the shortest route in terms of meters, but we penalize um, uh, informal crossings of major roads. Uh, for a tertiary road, there's a smaller number we add on. Um, and any formal crossing of the above, so where you've got signals or a zebra crossing or something, it only adds 60 meters because although you might have to wait for the crossing and not dodging cars. Um, so these are all figures derived from um, quite sophisticated, um, uh, discrete choice uh, modeling in other research. Um, so there, in this case, we see that one trunk road crossing is preferred either over two tertiary crossings, one of which is formal and one informal, plus the extra distance to come up the other side of the trunk road and get to here, or preferred over um, a single tertiary crossing, plus all the extra distance entailed going this way, which is a much quieter route, even goes through a park over here. Um, so. Now, this is not to be taken, obviously, before uh, people jump in to, to pipe up and rightly criticize that as a model of human behavior. It's not. It's, it's, it's far from complete. Um, but it's a simple and transparent model, and that allows a planner to consider the assumptions of the modeling process and just consider the different options on the table. Um, there's a walking summary layer for Monmouth. Um, again, uh, that 
flows integrated with the wider network as shown on here. Um, and the crossing symbol size now shows the severity of the crossing um, where instead of the flow. Um, a more recent development that's come out of this, looking uh, when I've started looking at the steep hills in Shepstow, um, I thought this photo best showed the steep hills in Shepstow. I mean, it's changed a bit since since it was taken, but um, uh, is an issue that we have with height data in sustainable transport models. Um, so one issue that came up in the model was that um, this section of the national cycle network um, is shown as not being used in the cycling model at all. And that's a bit baffling. Why is that? Instead, the model routes people either here down the busy bullet road or um, down the hill and up this completely unrideable steep path. Um, what is going on there? And if you watch this animation here, you'll see, um, if you keep your eye, if you can see my mouse pointer on this road, which is the one in question. And we're now, look, we're currently looking at it in plan view. And what I'm gonna do is rotate to a side view um, like, like that. So as you can see, when you we take these road networks and we effectively drape them over terrain data to see what sort of hills people are having to go up and down, as that data is not always available on the network itself. And it shows the, um, the errors that the terrain data is basically not accurate enough, even if it's um, only you know a high resolution five meter five square meter resolution uh, terrain model. Um, we get this sort of error out of it. Here's the actual path concerned. I mean, it's nothing great to look at, but it's definitely not wiggling up and down like what the terrain model would imply. So since this project, um, I've been going on to model uh, these problems. Here's another local case in point, actually. Um, Wintour's Leap near to Chepstow, a great spot for rock climbing, which tells you how steep it is. Um, here's the completely flat road that runs across the top of it, um, seen on Street View. Um, and here's that same view on Google Earth. Um, we've got this huge, here it comes, totally flat road, woo, 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 disappears down the side of the cliff and comes back up again because the terrain model is not good enough. Um, and this really impacts the sustainable transport model because we could be assuming no one wants to cycle this if it's too hilly, when in fact it's completely flat. Um, uh, and this is going to be relevant to loads of other places too. I mean, uh, here's uh, the viaduct at Kevin Coyd outside Merthyr Tydfil. Um, Merthyr, as we know, had uh, in the previous census, 2011, the lowest level of cycling to work in the UK. And it's it's a, an amazingly three-dimensional landscape here. You see the A470 viaduct is, you know, well, there's a tiny road down here, quite huge old railway viaduct, which is now a cycle path, but that in turn is dwarfed by the A470 viaduct way up above it. It's a very up and down sort of landscape, which explains in part the, the low levels of cycling there. Um, so I developed an algorithm since, which takes these uh, networks draped over terrain, and it basically smooths them out to remove all the height errors that come out of that process so we can model them better. Um, that's a shortly upcoming piece of research, and I plan to release it very soon as an open source tool. Um, next steps for all this, so uh, deep breath and where do we want to go next with it? Um, the plan of feedback from Sustrans was uh, firstly that modeling both sides of the road is useful, um, so we want to keep doing that. Um, reassuringly, the modeling outputs, we're told, showed strong alignment with the networks previously planned on the basis of local knowledge. Um, and of course, sometimes they differ and sometimes we can consider where we want to change networks, but there's a good degree of validation in that as well. Um, another big piece of feedback from the council, of course, is can we better quantify predicted uptake in all models, um, particularly the models of cyclists going on pedestrians going from everywhere to everywhere. Um, totally understand why people ask this question, because if people are trying, if the, you know, the council is trying to model their future carbon impact, carbon outputs or well-being, fitness, any kind of ultimate outcome measure, it'd be good to quantify this with some actual predicted numbers of people doing each thing. And I'd like to do it, but my response as a sort of as a scientist is to say I'd love to, but there's no way I'm going to do that without better quantifying the amount of uncertainty in those predictions because there, there is going to be a fair bit of uncertainty in them. Um, <clears throat> that brings me to where finally to where I'd like this agenda to go next, really, which is um, large scale simulations of um, walking and cycling infrastructure on a national scale. Um, but I'd also like to uh, fit models that adapt to the local context of each place, um, whether urban or rural. I, I haven't been in the Sustainable Places Research Institute for 10 years for nothing. Um, so, but at the same time, I'd like to draw out statistical regularities um, that we won't find 
without aggregating data from multiple sites. Um, bring in what I've done in some of my previous models, which is much better consideration of user heterogeneity. The fact that not everyone has the same preferences for travel mode and routes. I mean, I've done a lot in the past on the fact that cyclists differ in levels of confidence with cycling in vehicle traffic. So we have to consider that diversity in the cyclist population. Some prefer quiet routes, some prefer fast routes and so on. And leverage all available data, um, sensors, phones, travel diaries, sensors, and so on. Um, we've got some supercomputing facilities in the university, um, which I think I'll basically need to do this. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, essentially trying to get much more sophisticated modeling, but building on this framework of an open source, transparent and scalable um, and um, practically tested, you know, used on the ground framework we've been building in this project. Um, that's the future I see for this. Uh, thank you all for your time and I'm open to take questions. Thanks very much, Crispin. That was really interesting. Um, we'll give everyone a minute or two to um, think about what they've heard and see if they've got any questions for you. Um, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of interesting kind of aspects to the work that I'm sure people will have some questions on. So we'll just give them a moment to um, to have a think. Mm -hmm. It's worth saying again that we will make this available online. Um, so normally within a week or so of the presentation. So if after the event you do have any um, questions for Crispin or you want to discuss any aspects of what you've heard in more detail, then then do let us know and we can we can put you in touch. So okay, let's have a question now. Uh, oh, I've got some questions coming in. I'll, I'll read them yeah. out. So first, do, so do you want yeah, me to read them out for I... you? Um, yeah, well, um, I know that's right. I can. So, how do I know where cyclists go? Where which cyclists go? Where in real time? Um, so, in this project, we don't. Um, we're basically transferring the kind of all the parameters we derive from that sort of model. We're transferring it from other research we've done to estimate what is going on in the case of Monmouthshire. Um, in the case of Cardiff, um, I've done models where, on, you, as you go, uh, as you cycle around Cardiff, you occasionally see these little grey boxes on poles. Um, they're sensors that count the number of passing cyclists. Um, occasionally driving down the road, you'll drive over those hoses that go bump bump under your tires. Those are the Department for Transport sensors. Um, they count cyclists not very reliably, but they do count them. And the DFT do themselves sometimes show up and count people. Um, so um, we have access to all that. The, the sensor data, the, where there's a sensor installed, it's obviously more recent data. In some cases, it's just an annual survey. Um, of course, there are other sources of data, such as um, sort of uh, cyclist fitness apps like Strava, for example. I tended to run away from them because I don't see them as representative of the majority of cyclists. They, you know, they they are the chosen tool of the middle-aged man in Lycra, um, not necessarily the people we need to uh, try and make space for on our roads. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, um, Alois? You've got another question uh, there from TC Crispin. So if you want me to read that out yeah. for you, then I'll... Uh, yeah, yeah, um, sure. Yeah, you, you read out the question and I'll read it as, as well. <laughs> right, so it says, um, hi Crispin, is the problem with the DEMs or the georeferencing of the aerial satellite imagery onto those DEMs? I suspect it is a little of both. I recognize these technologies are getting better all the time, but is georeferencing a priority for someone like Google, i.e. what are the timescales that you think the tech will be accurate enough? Well, there's so it if there's money to go and accurately georeference stuff, it gets done. I mean, so for example, on the major road network, um, if you get ordnance survey data for the major roads, um, they've driven all along those, I presume, with some sort of very accurate GPS, and they um, you can get the elevation data straight off their network. The trouble is we don't have that for things like traffic-free cycle paths because they haven't been mapped out with the same degree of accuracy. Um, and we don't have it either for walking paths. Um, and so um, I don't know when it will be, you know, you'd need a very accurate um, terrain model. You know, the, the, the highest resolution data you can buy from the Ordnance Survey right now is um, is five, uh, five meters um, resolution. Um, but there's a secondary question here in terms of low budget of um, 
cycle models and the transferability of research is can we do as much of this as possible with open data and typically you can pick up open data models um, at about 50 square meter resolution so um, I, I see this as a kind of important role for the algorithm is actually in uh, applying in an international context where there's there may be good open data but there might not be the um, private data sets you can buy, uh, proprietary data sets, um, is basically being able to correct these lower resolution terrain models as well and make a good cycling model out of them. I don't know if that answers your question, TC. Thanks, Crispin, that's great. Um, we'll give uh, have a minute or two more in case there are any final questions. Um, and as I said previously, then if there's anything you wanted to discuss with Crispin in more detail, we happily put you in touch. Um, after this after this session okay well i think if there are, oh hang on it looks like we do have one more question Okay, no, um, it's, it's a comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a comment. Yes, and absolutely i mean there's there's loads of different sources of of data that you can get um absolutely and some are more accurate than others. Is, is the short story and it's and it's partly as i say it's partly a matter of affordability i mean local councils in the uk have free access to ordnance survey or at least it's included in their existing package somehow so they didn't they didn't worry about it for road data but um ooh, how can interested individuals get started modeling that's a very good question actually um i don't know your background warren um can you say anything on that it's so i i mean i essentially come from a I'm a sort of computer scientist turned geographer and in the process of turning back into a computer scientist again. And it, it's one of those, um, modeling is one of those processes that lives at a boundary of several different fields. I mean, that you, you don't have to have that background. There's, I've met people with all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, I would quite recommend reading uh, one of the big textbooks on transport modeling, like um, Ortizar and Williamson uh, Modeling Transport. Um, I'll pop a link to it in the um, chat if you like. But I mean, ultimately, it's a very inter interdisciplinary field in terms of having to work with people um, from all sorts of different backgrounds, some technical, some much more on the practitioner side. And it's it's very much a case of um, very much a case of um, communication between all those dis different disciplines. Um, all right, I've seen your answer. Um, um, Warren, drop me an email. Um, I'll think of some resources for you. Um, I... uh, there's my email in the chat. Thanks, Crispin. That's great. I think we do have one final <laughs> question. So I'll have a look at that. So it says, as a cyclist who has experienced the hills of Chepstow recently, uh, and not a techie. I wonder where the human experience is built into your work. So yeah, this is this is something essentially the the, the more human side I leave to Sustrans in a sense, who are um, very good at engaging the public and um, getting all that feedback and um, into the modelling and you know uh, well into the planning process I should say because the planning process is more than modelling. It's um, modelling informs it, and ultimately human decisions are taken on. Um, what needs doing on the ground um at the same time you know we there are there are a lot of behavioral studies out there which um ultimately spit out numbers which will tell you whether someone is say more likely to take a car or a bike in a certain situation or whether they're more likely to take route a or route b um and so the human experience comes from um experiments done with volunteers who um you know who are given uh, a travel um trip they must make and we see where they go or alternatively um from things like census data where we people have already told us how they get to work so we can kind of look for correlations in huge data sets um to try and draw out the trends there um in terms of the human experience actually finally that was i, I was very lucky to be commissioned to work on chepstow in this case because i well i live just outside it now i lived in it for two years as well and i yeah uh, would get back on the train from cardiff uni and cycle up some incredibly steep hills to get to my house so um yeah it was it was right it was a great opportunity to be involved in modeling something where I really knew the truth on the ground as well and I could see how um how well the models that the computer spits out um match my experience of actually cycling through there 
Lovely. Thanks very much, Crispin. Um, right. OK, well, I think we've got no further questions then that I will call it a day and uh, say thank you to oh, hang on, I've got one final question from Sarah, which we will um, we will come to. And I apologize as well. So I've got a snoring dog at my feet. So <laughs> apologize if it's coming through. Um, OK, so a uh, question from Sarah says, you breezed through a lot of successful modelling you've done, but what has been the biggest challenge for you in shifting the very normative assumptions that we all cycle, like lycrocad males, in order to build sustainable networks? That's, um, uh, I, I'm railing Sarah, sorry, slightly at the, um, the assumption that I, well, no, uh, the, the implication in your question that I ever assumed that, um, because, <laughs> you know, for, for years I have been modelling, uh, producing models that, I mean, although it's, quantified by a small set of numbers that um, sort of multiple diverse um, abilities of cycling through the network. So um, particularly with the Cardiff models, assuming that, um, you know, some people will, you know, we, we assume that we know that some people will want quiet routes and other people will want fast routes. Um, we don't know, in a, we, we don't assume that we know who those people are. We essentially just um, look at the actual flows you measure on links and see what combination of quiet quiet cyclists and fast cyclists will best explain the pattern we see on the ground and of course where research like yours um, comes uh, into use is actually looking at the societal reasons behind um, a lot of the, the differences there um, yeah so what's what has been the biggest challenge for me um, I think it always has been and remains like uh, essentially um, integrating my perspective on the world and yours um, I think we still got a lot to learn from one another in that way and I hope to keep doing that going forward Thanks, Crispin. That's a really nice note to uh, to end it on. <laughs> OK, well, uh, with that, I will uh, say thank you again to Crispin for presenting to us today. It was really, really interesting to hear about your work and be interesting to see where it goes um, moving forward. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, as Crispin said, if you've got any questions, then um, please do do contact him and I'm sure he'd be happy to discuss. Yeah, emails in the chat there. Lovely. Thanks very much, Crispin. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. OK, yeah, thanks all. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers.